Hi, this is Paul. I just posted this video. Let's see how the title does. Understanding the Jordan Peterson Rebel Wisdom Breakup. I had about five other potential titles, a lot more clickbaitery in my in my head, but I thought I'll I'll restrain myself because the last thing I want to do is actually inflame anything between these two individuals, both of whom I respect and appreciate, and you know want to continue to maintain at least some sort of relationship with both. I don't want the video to put a strain in that. But there are some real big differences of approach that are going on. And you'll notice in the in the thumbnail, I took a picture of, this is down the California coast, a picture I'd taken years ago. My kids were playing in those tidal pools. And uh, yeah, it's a tidal pool. And the waves come in, adds fresh water, some creatures get dropped in different pools, some creatures move about. That's in many ways what that video is about, that the times have changed. And for some, Jordan Peterson is in a very different location. He lost his job as a University of Toronto um, professor. He lost his job as a clinical psychologist. And in many ways, he's trying to find and figure out his new career now obviously as a writer really as a public intellectual on a place like daily wire plus and i talked about that in the previous video a number of the points that david fuller makes are important in his piece and but part of the thing part of what i've learned in my own little foray on youtube and having a broader audience than i had before is that something fairly obvious different approaches tend to attract or um, push away different kinds of people there's a there's sort of a the current daily wire approach there's there's a certain kind of audience that really likes that, obviously. And there's an aspect to that liking of it that others, often in the daily, often in the Rebel Wisdom group, they don't like it as much. And I'm probably, in that sense, closer to the Rebel Wisdom group than the Daily Wire group because... Whereas there are times when I'm in the mood for um, dunking on the libs. <laughs> but, uh, when, when before Mr. Reagan made that video that really launched his channel, I had an interview with him and he asked me, you know, about being a conservative. And I, I, it, the question took me by surprise because I had never in my life thought of myself as a conservative. I, in many ways, went on the IDW run with a lot of these other individuals and was sort of located in a different title pool than I ever had been before. Now, having said that, because I was always sort of a moderate to left person in the Christian Reformed Church, the Christian Reformed Church is only in a certain segment of the Overton window, and so I never really was a very uh, leftist person in the overall scheme of society. But, yeah, I got moved with the tides and the waves that moved the IDW as well. Now, just today, Aaron Wren posted a substack that talked about Jordan Peterson's third way. And what's interesting is that I don't think David Fuller would disagree a lot with this, that the Jordan Peterson we saw with Kathy Newman... The Jordan Peterson we saw with his students was in many ways more of a third way Jordan Peterson and the Daily Wire instantiation that we see there's anxiety in the Rebel Wisdom camp that this is Jordan Peterson living in a title pool with Ben Shapiro and being locked in by it. Now as again I said in the previous video it's very early days in terms of Jordan Peterson's relationship with Daily Wire. I tend to suspect that Peterson being Peterson, he's really going to... He, I don't know that there's a good Peterson containment unit. <laughs> I, I think he's going to um, 
He's going to have opinions. He's going to want to do things. And if they want to sort of try to contain him, I think, as we've seen before, efforts to sort of put him in a corner usually gets a pretty significant pushback. I'm just now noticing this new little feature of YouTube, which is most played, and it shows up in this little graph below. And so this conversation with Rod Dreher, I think, represents something fairly on center with, let's say, what Daily Wire is about. Let's see what the most played little segment is here than his parents and his grandparents. Uh, but he said that the higher he rose in his profession and the more money he made, the more uh, uh, anxious he was and the less happy he was. Well, he set out at one point to go do a, a photography project by interviewing the elderly people in his country, Christians who had been sent to the gulag in Slovakia for their faith. And a lot of them still lived in real poverty today and they had suffered terribly for their faith. But he said as he went to take their picture and hear their stories, he saw people who were deeply at peace and deeply mm -hmm. happy. Mm -hmm. One man mm -hmm. even told him that solitary confinement was one of the happiest times of his life in retrospect because there he communed with God and he knew he had union with God. Timo told me in the end this really changed him because he realized that he himself and was the tyrant in his life because mm -hmm. he had been seeking happiness and riches and all that, whereas he should have been seeking God, uh, like these old people who had suffered had. I think this- Now this is really interesting. Most of what happens before here is pretty standard anti-woke warning stuff that you will hear from Jordan and Rod fairly reliably. It's in the religious God part that there's the, there's the most replayed and the most interest. And again, the conversations tend to have a pace. And I don't know that Rod Dreher and Jordan Peterson had spoken much at all before this conversation. Yet, there's, you know, there's sort of part of the reason why I do so much biography when I have initial conversations with people is because I want us to get to know each other. And usually if it's a rando slot, They've watched plenty of me, so they have a pretty good idea who they are, but I don't know them. So once we get a chance to know each other, once people have told their story, once people see how you've handled their story, they're usually much more open to have a, I don't want to use the word authentic, but a, a, a truthful conversation with you, a more transparent, more a vulnerable conversation with you and and I think it makes for a better conversation and it actually increases to build a relationship and so for the first hour and 20 minutes of this video they basically talk shop but towards the end of the video on the daily wire part that's behind the paywall that's where the conversation gets more interesting and so again I haven't figured out how I'm going to deal with that if I'm going to sort of violate the paywall and do excerpts of it I am I, you know, I want to respect the paywall. I want to respect the paywall because I think that's just fair dealing. And I don't want to use the use my channel as, oh, this is the way you can get around the Daily Wire paywall. If they want to put stuff behind their paywall, well, then they want to put stuff behind their paywall. And it, it doesn't, you know, I, I don't necessarily want to sort of just out it from there. So, but this is... This is sort of, again, what we're seeing at the initial movement of, of Jordan in this. So one of you put me on to Just Pearly Things, a very interesting channel. She has a number of videos where they're, you know, watching Jordan Peterson with some big moments, usually Kathy Newman or the GQ reporter from the UK and and getting getting responses out of that. Part of what Aaron part of what Aaron noted is that again, it's this Jordan Peterson, it's the suspender video Jordan Peterson um it's the video of here he's listening to a student 
Now, this context, I think, is critical for bringing out different things out of people. So that whatever little title pool you're on, the exact nature of that title pool is going to impact how you respond. And, and in some ways, because of the nature of, of watching things on screens, we're sort of looking from above and we're not in the title pool with the person. And so we're sort of passing judgment not really from above, that's again sort of a monarchical vision, but we're passing judgment from a different title pool. And there's a certain, and, and so often we're not aware of the title pool that we're in. And that amount of distortion is in there. Now, now someone, Rick the other day, said, have you seen what Peter Bogosian is doing with his YouTube channel? I said, I didn't know Peter had a YouTube channel, but he has a YouTube channel and I think he's, again, here's the question. What is your goal? What is the goal for Daily Wire? Is it to build a big channel, mostly appealing to the base? And you can appeal to the base with hitting the same gotcha refrain moments again and again and again and again, because that you know, Verveke would have fancy words for that, but that, that's we're sort of wired to really like that. And some of us more than others. Or is your channel to, I mean, if, if part of what Rod Dreer and Jordan Peterson want to do is sort of stop a woke, stop the kind of thing from happening here that happened in Soviet Russia, that's that's really their 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 idea their thing. So we want to stop that from happening. Okay. Well, I don't know that anybody or many people within Daily Wire need to be convinced of that. That's the problem with that little siloed title pool. You're talking to all the same sea and enemies and crabs. It's not helping you. What what I see. Um, what I see Peter Bogosian doing here is really quite interesting. Five, four, three, two, one, move. Okay. So now, what are your reasons for standing on slightly agree? Well, I have a lot of friends. Now, now I want to be fair here because Jordan Peterson can't do this anymore because he's way too famous in many ways. And he's way too famous for a number of things. Peter Bogosian can do this because... Sorry, Peter, you're just not that famous. But also notice that context matters. In some ways, you can, even for all the anxiety about what's happening with American universities, you can still sort of do this on a university campus, or at least out in public. ...of color and seeing the things that they go through versus what I go through. Uh -huh. um, I, for example, going... And, and, and what's nice is Peter doesn't argue with them at all. He, he just basically asks questions. And again, and again, there's a lot of people who have done similar things to this. In some ways, the What is a Woman video does similar things to this. That, that directs them to be racist. It's that internally, somehow. And, people... and, and Peter's having, I don't think Peter's, he's listening. I mean, that's, that's a key thing always. He's listening to them. And Even though I don't know much, I feel like because I... And, and I think it really ends well. Um, the question is, how many unarmed black men do you think are killed? Uh, about the police uh, and racism in the police force. If you were to guess, you know, and you're not an expert, I'm not an expert, mm -hmm. I'm not a cop. Uh, but if, if you were to take a guess of how, how many um, um, black men were killed by the police, say, last year, what, roughly what number would you guess? Roughly. Again, you're not an expert. On, like, just take a guess. Oh, um, I would. This is just across America. Yeah, it, yeah, you know, yeah. Twelve months. Okay, I would say probably in the high hundreds, maybe okay. around eight. I just, I just 800? know. Yeah, I just know that there's a lot that we don't. Even though we do have technology and the internet and stuff, I feel like there's a lot that. Doesn't okay, no, it's, I'm shown. not an expert. You're not an expert. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying. And he doesn't tell her, and that's. That's really smart. Do you want to take a guess with that, or do you want to? We can end now because I'm going to do another claim. I imagine it's enough, as in disproportional. What, you imagine it's one? I'm sorry. Disproportional between 
killing black people versus white people, etc. Like, do you want to throw a number out there? She gave me 800. You think it's too low or too high or about right? I have no number. I don't know. All right. All right. Well, uh, I I appreciate appreciate that. Oh, one more quick question. Mm-hmm. What if I were to show you that that number evidence to your satisfaction and his satisfaction that that number were 22,500? Would you be willing to move to the strongly agree? I do. I would definitely think about it. I, I, I mean, he's handling this well. And then towards the end of it, of um, if you look at the data for murders, mm-hmm. self officers, yeah. But I slightly agree. Interesting. Okay. Well, thank you for your time. Both of you appreciate it. Thank you. He doesn't. He doesn't try to force anything on them. I mean, this is, this is very smart in terms of trying to convince people of something. Yeah. Fourteen. Yeah. And have them ask the question. It's. But so here's so here's the that total or here's the actual people? data. Black people are roughed up more than white people right. once they're in custody. Right. Black people are roughed up by black police officers as much as they are by white police officers. Yes, black people are also capable of racism. Correct. Black people are shot at disproportionate rates under the rates at which police officers shoot white people. There have been under 20 shootings of black police. And that's with like black, young black men launching themselves at officers. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole thing. So the number is closer to 14. Some people you ask it's 10, some people you ask it's 18, but every- And the way he's handling this is, I, I, I think he's, I, I was very impressed when I looked at this video. So a lot of it depends on what is your goal? What is your goal? And of course, Rebel Wisdom has has a different goal. Now, now part of what's going on here is the, we're anxious about the future. We want to have a better future than we have now. Now, I, I mentioned to this individual, he, he sends me a lot of good stuff. And I mentioned that I was going to use something that he sent me. And I didn't, I because I didn't, post the video I made two days ago because I didn't think it was quite ripe because the, the the conflict that's sort of out there between Rebel Wisdom and Jordan Peterson, David David Fuller and Jordan Peterson, is kind of sensitive because I, I very much want to see, I'd love to see both of them get in a room and have a good conversation and um, be able to shake hands and make peace and be able to work again someday, to be able to, you know, Jordan Peterson, Jordan Peterson terms, you know, be able to play again someday. Uh, this uh, this individual sent me this tweet by Bad Stats, and Bad Stats is an atheist, much more of sort of a, a new atheist, and he writes this. I read the article looking for something. This is the article that David Fuller wrote about what happened, what happened to Jordan Peterson. I read the article looking for something to dunk on David Fuller about, which is sort of what the other guy that I mentioned in the other video did. But nothing raised my hackles too badly, so instead I just say a bunch of my opinions. I think people should be extremely skeptical of public intellectuals. No one can produce enough original, true, and interesting research to be interesting for more than an hour or so per year. Okay, that's a really great point. Unlike face-to-face relationships, there's real churn in terms of YouTube. People become mapped territory, and... Jordan Peterson, for example, has continued to grow quite a bit. Now, is he growing beyond sort of, is he just kind of growing deeper into, let's say, conservatism? Or is he actually increasing numbers for conservatism? I don't know. But there's a mapped territory effect that once you see enough of PVK or David Fuller or Rebel Wisdom or Jordan Peterson, it's like, oh, on to something else. And... Bad Stats makes the point that, well, public intellectuals, there's always the churn. True. So the job selects for narcissistic charlatans. Read Weinsteins. Well, now we know what he thinks about the Weinsteins. I I think that's a little unfair. But part of the point is that in this attention economy, and even if you look at say, Jordan Peterson's analysis of Twitter that he did on a video, 
I listened to that this morning when I was driving back from getting an oil change in my car. And I noticed how I felt quite a bit differently about it, listening to it rather than watching it, which I found interesting. And that's that's another, that's that's almost always the truth. I don't think it's the case that it's always narcissistic charlatans. I think... And, and I think there are a lot of well-meaning, good-faith people out there who are trying to do things. They're all fallible. They all have, get some things right and some things wrong, and maybe more things wrong than they get right, just by virtue of complexity in the universe, but I'm not quite as pessimistic or cynical as he is on that. With godly talents for speaking in a way that's in, that's entrancing. It doesn't hurt to be shameless about stepping out of your lane. Actually, that really, I think it does hurt. Um, but this whole lane business, people, I should probably read the whole thing and then talk about really what he's talking about here. Peterson is a false epiphany machine. Worse, he can tell people just about anything and make them believe it's science. So I think anyone who ever took him seriously is a fool. But David Fuller seems to think that society has a need for cultural spiritual leaders like Peterson to tell us about the meaning of life and stuff. He's disappointed in Peterson because he's taking too much, talking too much about politics instead. Personally, I can't imagine something I want less than a very smart person telling me about transcendental things. But empirically, other people seem to want this, and it's probably silly for me to say that there should be no cultural leaders telling the sheeple what to think. So I don't know what the solution is. People don't want to listen to dry collections of facts from disparate experts they've never heard of. They want, they want a personality attached to their content so that they can get nice and parasocial. Yes, that's what people want. Why? I don't know if Bad Stats has thought a lot about cognitive science or... The challenge, you know, the, a big point that Verveke and Peterson and many others have made, which is what AI and the quest for it and the quest for robots sent us to is the realization that the world is too complex for us to know. And so what we need are filters. And so, for example, Google is, you think it's a search engine. What it really is, is a filter. It's an attempt to filter all of this information and do relevance realization to give you the thing that you're looking for. And the degree to which modern fil search engines work and actually filter is an astounding success because it's very, very difficult because the computer has to make a lot of basic guesses about you and what you want and are interested in. And we see this filter working almost all the time. Search for something on Google, and then suddenly there it shows up on Amazon, a product that Amazon thinks you're going to be interested in. Part of the reason we use people, our people, are is that people are really good filters because they're always filtering it themselves, and they're also repeating. And so we look at whole ranges of signals from other people and we experience them as intuitions. Do I like this person? Do I trust this person? And the liking and trusting, yeah, it's all really hackable. And it's often quite deceptive. But in many ways, it's sort of the best we've got. If you look at Yuval Harari's books, he makes the point that, yeah, this is, this is how we are. And maybe AI is going to do better. Well, maybe. But that gets into... A bunch of the stuff that I dealt with in the other video about the question about limits. And it raises the kinds of questions about the future that we're anxious about. So, so in this video, I, I talked about Balaji on Tim Ferriss and you know, in the in the context of Paul King's North, it's very interesting that for David Fuller, the King's North Harrington conversation is something that he's really keying into because when it comes to the future, I think we don't know what's coming down the road. Karen Wong sent me this video with the timestamp 
very much in line with the video where I talked about Balaji. And let's let's just listen to what he has to say. Now, again, Michael Levin, he's been on Karen Wong's channel. He's had his conversation with um, John Verveke. He's doing some very interesting stuff, and he's, he's willing to go on these small channels, and here he's talking here. This, this is very interesting. Do you call them bots instead of straight up organisms like you one of Xenocubes. one of the really cool papers you sent us i'll try to put all these in the description too is uh where you're sort of making this dichotomy between machines and organisms well i'm trying to burn down the dichotomy Bur sorry oh uh, yeah sort of interesting. i'm trying to burn down the dichotomy and this is where he sort of sounds like balaji and and again i don't i don't imagine any bad faith or ill will with these individuals. I think in their minds, again, they, they want to make the world better. But figuring out what better is, is no small thing. Are you thinking about the one where it was talking about the intelligence of machines? Yeah, you, you do make some like specifications, right? Uh, where like uh, Anastasia says, you, you're saying that, you know, organisms are intelligence at all these scales and uh, machines never could be even intelligent. And... I've, 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 I've never said they couldn't be. I, what I, what oh, I really? think I said. So, no, no, I don't think so. Well, hopefully, uh, hopefully I've never. There is a <laughs> heading in one of the papers that says yeah, yeah. machines are not intelligent and never. Oh yes, be. yes. Okay. That's because, but, but uh, yes, yes. This is the First Corinthians problem. But that's because those headings. If you look at all the headings, we are basically what we're doing is we're we're trying to we're trying to demolish the the the, the typical statements that are made by mm. people. I see, that's I one see, of the I things see. that we're arguing against. All, all of the all of those headings are things that we are. But basically, the rest of the text is trying to shoot it down. I see. So, so you're, you're trying to say that the the idea of a machine, as we understand it, is outdated, and that we need to start thinking about machines in different ways. Here's here's what I think. Uh, this a lot of the terminology that people use around this machines robots um organisms uh intelligence a lot of these things the, the the definitions we have now are not going to survive the next couple of decades they are based on extremely outmoded criteria that are i mean look in, in the olden days some number of decades ago you could walk up to something if you didn't know what it was you could knock on it and if you heard a clanging metallic sound you could you could know several things it came off a factory I'm morally uh, in my rights to do whatever I want with this thing, take it apart, put it in the garbage heap, fine. And it's going to be boring and it's not going to do anything interesting, right? Whereas if you do this and it's sort of wet and, and, and kind of squishy, right? And, 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 you know, sort of like that, then you would say, ah, this, this was evolved on Earth. It wasn't designed by, by, a, by a mind. Uh, I better be nice to it. And I can expect some really interesting hijinks, you know, if I, if I have it in my house. So that th 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 those conclusions ba were made entirely based on the limitations of past technology they're not deep they're they're just to to you know the total crap basically at this point they're not going to survive you now now we have machines that that are that are um that are evolved using using evolutionary strategies there are designed organisms um going into the future what you look like and what you're made of and how you got here your origin story are going to be terrible guides to your moral um, standing and to your cognitive capacity mm -hmm. they're, they're going to be terrible you you will we will be surrounded that i mean this is this is just terrifying and and this actually scares me a lot more than the threats that jordan peterson and rod Dreer are talking about in terms of the the rise of the woke i i think i think wokeness will come apart but this kind of thing i mean we oh let's let him finish this is this is something i was just writing about the other day we are going to be surrounded by every possible combination of evolved living material um designed uh, artificial materials and software Every kind that you can think of, the, 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 you know, that Star Wars cantina scene is going to be just totally tame compared to what, how we're actually going to be living. And this distinction when people say machines can't do this and mach if, if you just if you just push on that a little bit and say, OK, tell me what a machine is, tell me what a robot is. And, and by the way, that definition better be useful beyond like 1960.
You mm -hmm. know, it better be a modern definition that, that doesn't lean on these ridiculous uh, limitations that are just not even true anymore. It's certainly not going to be true in the future. So, so that's, yeah, so that's. And, and that's, if I recall, first of all, I love that you're obsessed with definitions. That's something that we are completely nuts about at Demystifying Science and our, you know, we have a Facebook group and most of what we do is argue about definitions. And so that's awesome. What, and I believe you, just before we go any further with that, the machines you define as basically they they have to be useful, right? Is that is that something? That's that's one way to that's one way to do it. Um, I think is so. So just to back up a second, here's here's what I think about definitions. Definitions are meant to the 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 reason you want definitions is to facilitate progress. You don't want definitions that uh, that that hinder you from from thinking in various ways. Again, that facilitate progress. Boy, how do we know what progress is? As I said before, we. We, we bump into a problem. Let's, let's, let's talk about the pill. We bump into a problem. Unwanted pregnancies. Wow. Contraception. Yeah, that's a problem. Some you know, people have a, have a big drive for sex and it overwhelms. In, in one moment, it overwhelms what they're thinking of and who they are and what they want to do. But then, you know, a baby is conceived and so, well, abortion and bring it to term. And so... Contraception, wow, solves a lot of stuff. Yeah, but we have a really hard time knowing how it's going to impact everything. And we have this, again, in a, ooh, smartphone, we can have the internet in our pocket. Yeah, but social media, now I can, I remember when Facebook came out, now I, I can find all the people I went to high school with. That's kind of cool. And find out a little bit about their life, and that's all right. And But again, finding it at my age... Growing up with it, well, now we're so figuring out what social media is doing to people. And so to me, there are no, uh, and this, this, this also gets me crazy. Some people will say, well, that's just a metaphor and it's not, okay, everything is a metaphor. There's, there's not, we, don't have, we don't have access, at least I don't believe that we have access to any, any real objective truth ever. What we have access to are metaphors, which can be good, or they can be more or less useful, right? So, what I, so I'm going to suggest that to the extent that you want to use the word machine, for example, um, <clears throat> it better be a definition that is that is useful in some fashion. It helps you do something. So to me, right now, a useful definition of a machine doesn't have anything to do with what you're made of or whether you were designed or evolved. I, I think the salient, and, and I'm not saying I have a, the, the best answer, by the way, I'm sure I'm sure there's plenty of work to be done to get better definitions of all of, of and, and it's so interesting where that dichotomy designed or evolved because i've evolved is well, that's just the product of random process designed well designed has an owner all of this but i think the interesting thing about a machine is that it's a system that works according to uh, understandable logical rules that's able to be manipulated to uh, for specific outcomes well, that sounds like nature. So now a machine is something that you can, with, with sufficient effort and brain power, you can say, okay, I see how this works. And part of seeing how this works is if I wanted to change it to do something it doesn't normally do, here's how I would do that. Mm -hmm. right? Anything you can do that to, that's, that's a machine. So um, I, I also, the other important thing about all of this is that I don't believe... Like a guard dog? believe in binary definitions for almost anything so there's no such thing as i, I don't think yes this is a machine that is not a machine it, it there's no binary about machines there's no binary about cognition about consciousness about intelligence it's never does it or doesn't it it's always how much and what kind so if somebody shows me uh somebody shows me um uh you know a, a bacterium i'm going to say Yes, that's that's quite a. It's got many properties of what you consider an organism. It's got quite a few properties of what you would consider a machine. By the time you get to a human, it has some of the properties of the machine. There's a lot you can do with the physiology and the behavior, and there's a, but it's got a bunch of other stuff that uh, really uh, you, it wouldn't help you to treat it as a machine. At least now it wouldn't. Maybe sometime in the future you could. Um, so does context have a lot to do with this then? Like, does a definition need to be set in some place? Like. You know, if I'm sitting here next to a washing machine and we're trying to decide which of two of us is the machine, maybe one definition would work quite nicely. Whereas, did he say just say that his wife is a washing machine? Does she do the wash? If you're comparing me to something 
that's a little bit more on the edge where you're talking about like an engineered organ or something it's kind of you know a little bit I, trickier I, I, or like yeah, a pancreas I, 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 versus I, an insulin pump i think is maybe like a better oh boy uh yeah i think uh I, th I think they're, they're certainly both kinds of machines. They have different, uh, th th there's some different properties and, and the, the, they're uh, useful in different circumstances. I think it's not just context. I think it's all observer dependent. So it's everything to, to me, everything is in the eye of the beholder. It's in the eye of the observer. Now the observer, by the way, might be the system itself when it looks at itself. We can talk about that in a minute. But, but if, I, if I look at something and I say, and it's the same thing with seeing intelligence. If I look at, uh, at, 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 at you and the washing machine. And my goal is to, I need a paperweight. I need a really good paperweight. I look at the washing machine. And I go, that's awesome. That thing, I'm going to set that thing down on my papers. That's not going anywhere. You are a terrible paperweight because you have a tendency to get up and wander around. <laughs> yeah. I don't like it. So, right. Yeah. So, so that's, so that's one thing. On the other hand, if I want, uh, you know, if I, if I want, um, you know, if I want you to, uh, uh, you know, do, do some kind of useful thing, I'm going to say, this washing machine is very limited. I'm never going to get this thing to like guard my house or do anything else. All it does is this one thing. It's a very boring kind of machine. I, I, you know, you look at, a, at an organism, you say that that is a much more interesting machine that has all kinds of stuff. And, and maybe I can get it to do certain things. And maybe I can't because it's a it's a it's a kind of machine that is self-motivated. And at some point you might decide to just leave. And then, you know, uh, yeah. So it's in the eye of the of the observer. All of this. It's just terrifying because does that kind of destroy the, the any chance of defining life itself, if we can't really separate machines from organisms? Well, look. Uh, what what do we really? What useful definition of life do we really have to begin with? If if you you ask yourself, I told you this was going to get scary. Karen was right. If, if uh, what, what tools do we have when we go to other planets and uh, or, or synthetic biology, if I may, I mean, already we, pe people make all kinds of stuff that that you can have a week of arguments about whether it's it's primitive life or not. Right. Um, and, and, and and knowing what you find on you're, you're sitting home one day and a spaceship lands on your front lawn and this this thing trundles out and it's kind of shiny and metallic, but it walks up to you and it's got this poem that it wrote on the way over. Right. And it's like, look, I, I'm, I'm here to meet you here. And you're looking at it. And so now it, what do you have in your toolkit that you're going to say, is it alive? Is it is it what does it have cognition? Was it made by someone? Did it evolve somewhere? We and usually that... I mean, we and, and to pull a Jordan Peterson out here. The real question is, how do I act towards it? How do I relate to it? How do I engage? Do I run away? Do I shoot? Do I worship? Do I talk? I mean, what, how, what, what do I do with it? And the problem is we're really bad at this. And, and the world is so complex. And we're so easily fooled. I mean, again, another Jordan Petersonism. You can always make things worse. And it's amazing things work as well as they do. This from Just Pearly Things, which... You know, now that, of course, I watched one or two of her videos, now the YouTube algorithm is kicking up uh, greatest hits at me. And this this was quite a video. Xavier, $5. Thank you, Tarot. Um, Met one a career to get girls. The girls are a prize for a success. What is a prize for women? And who is going to care for you when you're alive, when you're 60? Okay, so let me let me re-say that. Mm -hmm. Men want a career so they can have success. Women want what? And, and again, we, we listen to this so they can have success. As if we all know what that means. As, you know, again, we, we're always running around with these definitions. Life, machine. That, that We all know what that means. We don't. What we know is that sort of good enough to, to kind of make things through as we go. So a man wants a woman to be successful. But what does a woman want? And it's a really good question. What does a woman want? Uh... uh... The girls are the prize for his success. The girls are the prize for his success. Okay, and? What is the prize for a woman? What is the prize for a woman? Go ahead, Pearl. What is the prize for a woman? For a woman's success. Are you saying for success or in a relationship? For success, like okay. a woman's success. So, okay, let me rewind. Man wants success and the grand prize is it's a hot woman. Mm -hmm. 
women want and, and why do men want a hot woman well they want you know a hot woman is sexually attractive and they want good sex and they think well if she's hot the sex will be good not necessarily true but they the, the woman is sort of a a status intensifier it's sort of like the ring of sauron for the for the guy you know oh look he's got this trophy wife he's a hot woman he must be a great guy it's all about status and signals etc cetera, etc cetera. but what's in it for the woman want success what is the prize for that success we're talking success like in career, career wise yeah um a lot of money and lonely usually yeah. <laughs> usually an empty apartment but a lot of money to spend. now the title of this older women are lying to you here's why so clickbaity title <laughs> and that's not doesn't sit well with you i mean i think people are free to choose what they want to choose if that's what you want to do go do it mm -hmm. like but I, I think a lot of but you're going to suffer the consequences for your poor decisions and this is of course is what wisdom is all about and Wisdom is, again, back to wisdom is about learning things that you haven't had biological time to learn on your own. That's what wisdom is. Women do that and they chase the bag and they chase the career and then they find themselves alone at 50, 60. And it, that's not fun. Got and it. I think and I think a lot of older women lie to younger women about mm -hmm. this. And that's what rubs me the wrong way. That's why I do what I do, because I just don't believe in lying to women. How do women, older women lie to younger women? Because they'll say things like like the happiest sector of women <laughs> is like 45 and childless. But you could find 10 studies that disprove that for the one that they have that didn't have a proper sample size. So you're, you're pushing this narrative because you don't want to be alone in your poor choices. Mm. And I just, I, that doesn't sit well with me. You don't want to be alone in your poor choices. You want other unhappy people to be alone in their poor choices with you together. I don't, so they're almost like validating their poor decisions is what you're saying? Yeah, and you can see it in the media all the time. Like mm -hmm. every poor decision a woman makes, like you see it in the media. Like for example, like women gain weight, right? What, what body positivity, that's oh, the yeah. next thing that comes out. Well, we eight. just talked about that yeah. with Jordan Peterson, Rolo. Yeah, how <laughs> yeah. the one big girl was on the cover of SI. Yeah, and and I've been overweight and that you can lose it. So why are we tripping? <laughs> <laughs> like why are we tripping? And, and they do the same thing with age now too. You see them pushing like what is it ageism that, mm -hmm. that's the new word for oh, it oh yes because, because the older women are upset watch watch the body language so so these two women have these two women both have youtube channels that that rudy pointed me to but the third woman she's gonna her little speech right now she's not really buying this uh, that, because they're lonely. Yeah, yeah. They're mad that they're not getting the same sexual offers that they were getting in their youth. Mm -hmm. Shocking. Yeah. Coco, you found success in which and they're not getting the same sexual offer, offer offers, but the sexual offers are again. We're is, is do women just want sex? I mean, I can pull out that New York Times piece where this woman feels ghosted, and what what does she want? She wants sure she wants sex. I mean, that's 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 fun. That's pleasurable, but. She wants a commitment. Well, why does she want a commitment? Well, she wants a future. What does it mean to buy what she wants a future? She wants she she doesn't want to be lonely in the future. Well, she wants something meaningful. She wants um, she she's got a vision. There's an eschatology. There's a telos. There's something out there that she wants, and and she has a sense that when she's young, her sexual attractiveness might in fact give her a leg up in order to get what she wants in the future now there's a lot of women who aren't necessarily nines or tens who frankly are able to do that usually by virtue of wisdom and also by virtue of established communities that have established norms whereby even low status men and women can play this game and do so enjoyably because the truth is after a certain age you know, we also used to joke about, you know, we would, would want to take pictures of people and some people, I don't, I don't want you to take it, especially older people, I don't want you to take a picture of me. I don't look so good. And the point is, always take a picture because you're going to look worse 10 years from now, okay? It's, it's just the way it is, generally speaking. What you're doing, uh, same question to you. Men find success and the grand prize is women. What is Now, the for those of you who are listening, all of these women, all of the people on the stage are good looking people. Uh, rank ordering, I don't, taste, blah, 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 blah. This is a very attractive woman, okay? This, she's, she's, she's looking like a trophy wife, all right? The 
grand prize for being a successful woman? Freedom and money. Because when you... Freedom and money. You have your own career. You obviously make money if you're mm -hmm. successful. Money equals freedom. So you can do whatever you want. Doing whatever you want. Is that meaningful? Not really. Um, it's going... Doing, we all have a sense that meaningful is hard. Doing whatever you want, hmm. is it pleasurable? Happiness? Yeah, sometimes we certainly. But it's the opposite of constraint. But often it's constraint that produces meaningful situations. But to Pearl's point, <clears throat> let's say you're that forty-five-year-old woman, successful millionaire, <clears throat> amazing house. You know, a couple cats running around. Shout out to the cat owners <laughs> out there. But would that be fulfilling I, if you I, never got married and had, didn't have I, kids? I don't think that you can't be successful and have a husband or a boyfriend or whatever. I don't think... What, what is successful? I think it's either or. You can do both is yes. what you're saying. Yeah, because okay. I see it right now. Like me and my boyfriend, we both work literally 24-7. Like we mm -hmm. work weekends. We Like we work mm -hmm. all the time. But we both work from home. Mm-hmm. Okay, we both go on meetings, go on shoots and whatever, whatever he goes do for mm -hmm. his work. But we're shoots. So maybe she's a model still there and we're still enjoying each other. And I what I love. That's why I said that what we appreciate with each other. We're both very ambitious and we talk mm -hmm. about work a lot mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we work on projects together. So it's not that he is doing his own thing and I'm doing my own thing and we don't even know what's going on. So in other words, she's again, she talks about money and freedom. But what she says, she's really valuing is the communion that she's enjoying and the partnership that she's enjoying with her boyfriend, not her husband. Now, right now, she looks good, and, you know, she's, she's the kind of good-looking that she'll probably look good all of her life, and she'll be able to attract attention from some man. But this man, will she be able to have an established trajectory? Will she be able to maintain a family? Will she? I mean, all of those tremendously meaningful things. One thing I tell my children often, I say there are, there are a few things as meaningful in my life as I've seen than, you know, my children and my relationship with my children and having them Having children is a tremendously meaningful thing, and that grows as you grow old, whereas the, the, the great trips and maybe the recreational sports and maybe all of the stuff that money can buy, you know, you get to a certain age and the body can't sustain everything that the money can buy. And as a pastor, I've seen that. I've seen people, you know, they're fighting aging and they're trying to do everything they did when they were 30 or 20 and they, they just do and do and do and then you can't. The age of decay, baby, it gets us all. In our work life. Do you think do you think he respects you more because you've got a lot going on? Yes, he said that he he would never be with a girl who doesn't, who, who's not driven. I don't know if I'd be with a girl who says wit with a girl, with a girl, with a girl. You know, a little My Fair Lady action going here. Got it. So, so respect so, to him. And, and and have you ever been with a guy who found you a little much, like too work-oriented? Like, you're a little intimidating. Have you been with a guy um, like that ever? I wouldn't say that I was ever, like, intimidating. At least nobody told me that. Mm -hmm. But I know that... I, I, I think if I were... If I were her same age and I was meeting her and we were both young, I'd be intimidated like heck from her. Be just... A lot of guys don't like when a girl is very vocal about her opinion. And I'm very... <laughs> a lot of people don't like when other people are very vocal about their opinions. Very vocal about my opinion. So when it comes to being submissive, I couldn't do that because that's just not my personality. Got but it. that's not my personality and that's why I left mm. the comfort of my own home. That's why I'm trying to do my own thing. Go ahead, Ali. So I have a question because you want to have this very successful career. You, I think earlier in the hallway you said you wanted to be a billionaire. Yes. And then you're saying that you're pretty much in an equal partnership. So my question is, is your money going to be both of yours money or is it just going to be your money? Now, if you were married... All of your money would be all of your money, okay? Tip, tip to the person who's making less than their partner. Like, how are the how are the finances going to break down in that? When? Because earlier I heard you say that you wanted all of your bills paid. 
But then you're talking about having a career. When did I say that I want my bills paid? It was, it was much earlier in the conversation. No, I want my bills unpaid. I would have to go back and rewatch it. That I need my bills paid? Oh, you said you didn't split it 50-50. Yes. No, I yeah. meant for dinners. Oh, oh, okay. oh if you're okay. talking about equal oh, okay. housework, then, okay. then no. yes. So that was my confusion. No, I make him pay. I was like, is your money going to be both of y'all's or is it just no, me No, 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 no. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, let's, let's talk about that. The money in a relationship. Mm -hmm. What should you split? What should the man take care of? What should the woman take care of? Let's talk about the money. Like, how does it work in your marriage? Well, he pays majority. Uh, now, now, part of what's going on here is that with the, with the, with the massive disruptions, and this is what I mean by so many political things are like, well, we don't want, we don't want to have the Soviet Union happen to us. It's not the way it's going to be. Soviet Union was also embedded in a technological society of the early 20th century to the late 20th century. And the technological disruption that is happening to us is, is scrambling things in a way that we don't understand. And so part of what this whole video is about is because things are changing so fast that we have to talk about this. And, and we're, we're having difficulty talking about just about anything. So what we're doing is we're having conversations on YouTube to watch other people talk about it. And we're getting ideas. And then we're having our own little conversations about them and our own little commentaries on them. But, but again, back to the Mike 11 thing. But, well, what if, what, what, you know, and science fiction, of course, is going there already. Well, what if I can have a nice, soft, squishy, warm machine that, you know, I mud? I mean, science fiction people have been playing with this forever. Of most of the bills, I have a very small income that I bring in. It's supplemental income, but that's mostly because I can be fulfilled in that. I think if I wanted to make candles and make no money, I think he'd be fine with that. But that's kind of... Now, her and her, I think her husband, her and her husband have a relationship where... They've got certain agreements that seem to satisfy them both. And it's not about the money, partly because once you get married, you don't have to necessarily keep paying attention to each other's money because legally it's a common pot. How the breakdown is, and he takes a lot of pride in doing that. He's very happy to protect and provision. And I think a lot of men don't get to have that opportunity where they could have that intimate of a relationship with their wife, female partner. And how does the money work in your marriage? Because you said your boyfriend is pretty successful. Uh, did I say marriage? Sorry. Yeah. Dear relationship. Not going well, girl. Uh, how does it work? You guys split rent. You guys split food bills, utility bills. Does he always pay for dinner? Like, she's be being very open and honest, saying, look, he makes all the money. I'm here to support him. We You've both been make open money. and honest saying, hey, we both make money. So how we do the bills break down? Uh, well, we kind of try to see where we, we're very open with our finances. So, like, he knows how much I make. I know how much he makes. And then we decide together what we're going to spend on what. Like, he pays the rent, so maybe I'm going to pay for the car or something. So, like, we... So, But he pays the rent. Yeah. Period. He pays the rent. Yeah. Well, the rent is the biggest expense that someone will have. Not necessarily. Well, what do you mean? Of Gross course it's the biggest expense. No, like groceries and the car gets expensive. No, groceries well, are a third. How much do you spend on groceries? No, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm I'm not buy even. I'm not even. I'm not even. I'm not even. I'm not even. But the reality is. <laughs> I don't think she eats that much food. Rent or housing <laughs> is the biggest expense. Yeah, like, yeah no, he not, pays the rent. Okay. But Checklist. being the man in the relationship, paying the rent, you're living technically under his roof, does that qualify him to have a little more say in the relationship or no? No, I wouldn't say that because I don't quantify certain things. So like if he pays the rent, but maybe I'm going to, I don't know, maybe I'm actually physically going to go buy the groceries. So I'm going to put my time and my effort and my energy into doing something and he's going to do, do you, something else. Do you do all like the cooking and cleaning? No. Okay. We, we, uh, he's a Virgo, so, so he's like, so really what, good. like, because yeah. he's, you know, paying the yeah. rent, that's really nice. Does he, yeah. like, what does he get in return? What does he get in return? Mm -hmm. He gets a lot in return. Okay. <laughs> that's one of the funniest parts of the whole video. Like, what? Like, like, I'm gonna keep that, I don't know, not answered. Oh, okay. <laughs> what did you mean by that? Yeah, I'm so I just, you, uh, <laughs> if a dude was paying my rent, like, I'd make sure that every, like, I would do the cooking, cleaning, I would do everything. <laughs> in the house so you're just, saying if a guy's paying your rent you're doing everything yeah free rent what around the youtube channel though what around the youtube channel though 
What do you mean? Your YouTube channel. You really enjoy that, mm -hmm. right? So I think you would find a way to fit in your schedule, mm -hmm. prioritizing your relationship, and while mm -hmm. also not essentially sacrificing oh, all I, of your channel. Yeah, well, I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't just like do nothing. I think you could cook and clean yeah. and still do other things. Mm -hmm. no, but I think you guys are mishearing what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. Like, if he pays the rent, okay. But let oh, let me give you a whatever. Let's say the rent is five k. It's not five k, but let's say it's five k. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm gonna spend. Two, three k for something else. Mm -hmm. So it's not like tit for tat. So like he pays rent, but maybe I'm gonna spend the same oh, so amount of money for something else. So it's more like fifty fifty. You it's say not here. fifty fifty because that's just not how I was brought up, and that's not how I was raised. <laughs> okay, what would you say? It's like eighty twenty. It would be seventy thirty. Seventy thirty. Okay. So she was raised with seventy thirty. Were you, were you were your parents married? I mean, is that a fair split? The the dude pays seventy. I mean, it sounds what what I believe most women would expect is the seventy thirty. They might not say it, and I think that that seventy thirty is the new fifty fifty because we're going to downplay the man's money versus the woman's money. If that makes sense, I think this is essentially a, a modern relationship, and I don't prefer modern relationships. And I think they have, you know, th their own issues because I don't think there's that sweet intimacy that is between a feminine woman and a masculine man, where you just have these understanding of your roles within the home. But some people want to gender bend and they want to do their relationships how they want to do it. I know that I, if I had to grow up in that kind of situation where I didn't see either one of my parents, I don't think I'd be happy with that. Mm -hmm. And I want to just say I was in a relationship before where I was, he was taking care of everything. And mm -hmm. I was just like, mm -hmm. I still had my thing going on, whatever, but like he was in control. And I felt that I, I that was just not for me because mm -hmm. I felt very, um, like, I don't want to hear an argument, like get out of my house. Like, that's not something I would ever want to hear. Mm -hmm. So I would not put myself in that situation because this just doesn't work for me. Do you think it depends on the guy? For sure. So like maybe yeah. that was just the wrong guy. Yeah, that, yeah. that's, yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah definitely. So bad stats, it's always wrapped in people. It's always wrapped in people. It's wrapped in people because there are just a myriad of decisions that happen. And so we track how we feel about other people. We track their relationships. We track their opinions. We care what they think about things outside their lane. Now, the fact that we have some understanding that and and Aaron Wren points this points this out. Um, and I think I think Wren he's, he's culturally engaged. He has skin in the game. He holds frame. He speaks the truth. He stands ground without getting defensive. He de demonstrates mastery of his material. He has credentials. So yeah, we do care about lanes, but it's 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 always going to be with people because. Even even with a conversation like like this one, where there's radical reorienting of how many things, it's it's always going to be people centric, and this this goes back to the real social dilemma that what's engaging about social media is the people. Even these women talking about well, they they'd be old and lonely. And, you know, going back to my conversation with 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 Vouch, I think deep uh, I think the deep problem <laughs> with our contemporary approach is simply this. We look at people as means to an end. This person or even this relationship is a way to make me happy. And, and that's the commodification of other human beings. And I believe that human beings are not to be used but are to be loved now you have the question now then we say well how can we get people to well first of all let me tell you as the pastor there's no getting people to do anything you know i i i make a living talking to people and telling them what they're all willing to support me saying to them and them turning around and not wanting to do it because it is not natural for us to love in the kind of ways we all want to be loved and what it takes, and I think you're very much when you say humans work best operating in community, because what it takes is for the community to be 
gathered and focused and an agreement around certain values and factors such as human beings are to be loved and not used. And what that means when you go into a marriage is that you say, I am not going into this marriage for my happiness. I am going into this marriage for the sake of the other. Now, there's definitely that can get twisted in an abusive relationship, and that certainly does happen, and there needs to be intervention when that does happen. But what it takes is for one person to basically say, I'm going to lay down my life for another person. You know, usually not to that extreme, but you, when you have a child, you lay down your life for that child because there's no more selfish individual in the world than a newborn because that newborn wakes up in the middle of the night and says, I want to be fed. I want to be changed. I want it right now. You talk to that newborn all you want. It ain't going to make a difference. And so what we do and what marriage actually teaches us is to learn to love. And what love means is to lay down our life and give our lives for others. And how do you, how do you create a community where where people live that way and are surrounded by that value, well, that's what I do as a pastor. That's it. Leave a message. Leave a message. I sound like an answering machine. Leave a comment. 